So, I have a story for us all to remember this morning, and it is something that I'm certain that I've talked about already in the going on 10 months that I've been here, and I'm certain in your spiritual walk you too have also heard the story of the prodigal son, right? So this morning we're going to call it something different. We're going to call it the story of the prodigal God. You're thinking, oh, he's lost everything. <laughs> no, because I want, to, I want you to raise your hand if you know the true meaning of the word prodigal. You see, we, we come to church, we hear stories, we hear, hear them called all sorts of things by pastors, and we think, oh, that's, where, that's why he went to seminary, is because he knows what the word prodigal means. I, I don't have to know what it means. Because that's him and, and it's not me. Wrong. This morning, we're going to look at the word prodigal because it's going to help us with what we are studying this month, the Beatitudes. So, raise your hand. All right. Yes, sir. Ooh, excellent word. Excellent synonym. Lavish. Okay, there's, a, there's an aspect of prodigal that is lavish, yes, but it, it, it doesn't quite capture what we think about the son. So if we're saying that the, previously we've called this the story of the prodigal son, and now we're going to learn to call it the story of the prodigal God, lavish is a good beginning. Continue. Recklessly extravagant. Oh, she's Googling. <laughs> Not fair, not fair. Recklessly abandoned. Extravagant. Recklessly extravagant. Good one. So she left out the wastefully part. Le <laughs> recklessly, wastefully extravagant. Lavish. So why would we have the audacity to associate these kinds of words with God. We know the story because the story, we put the emphasis, we put the emphasis on the boy. The younger boy. And because we do that, I think that we miss what actually happens at home. Because we're watching him go over the hill to the far place. We're watching him take what is rightfully his, which if you study uh, Palestinian habits, you understand was probably not half, was probably more like a third, because he was the second son. But nonetheless, he has, he has committed a, a community sin he has said something about the community and about the traditions and about his father that we find repugnant. Nice other word, right? I think of pug dogs when I say that. So, you know, we find it distasteful what he did to his father. So here we are concentrating on him when we have this, this story in our minds, but we forget that there is a father in the story. And we forget that Jesus told this story in front of the scribes and Pharisees who purported, who, who said that they were the ones to tell everyone about God. And so he's, he's telling this story and, and the concentration goes on the person who has done the bad thing. And we then associate that word prodigal with bad actions. That's why it's kind of revolutionary to say, why don't we associate that word and all of its synonyms that we have come up with today, lavish, uh, spending without thinking. Why don't we associate that with the Father? Who, let's just take inventory here, goes ahead and liquidates a third of his assets that were rightfully the inheritance of the younger son. He, he goes ahead and he liquidates a third of his assets. Hmm. 
When, what other third can you remember? I'm just thinking about this right now. Is there another third you can remember that was liquidated and sent over the hill through the universe? Never thought of that until this moment, but interesting that that's what happens. He gives it to his son. I don't know if it was willingly. I don't know if it was with a smile on the face, but he gives it to the son. Gives. He just does it. Doesn't think about, oh, should I? Shouldn't I? No. He just does it. And then he also watches as his son walks over the hill and into the far country. Now, the father is not planning to go to that far country with him, but he does know from hearsay what happens in that far country, and it's not what happens at home. And he, he may have received reports. Jesus tells the story, and, and I want you to know that he is telling the story, and he's going to use He's going to use all the best storytelling techniques. And, and, and part of that is, is something that the English people will tell you is hyperbole, the English teachers. Hyperbole means exaggeration. Okay, He's telling a story to an audience and he wants them to get the point. He really, really does. And so he, he starts out, remember these are uh, Israelite people he's talking to, and he's talking about an Israelite man and his sons who are supposed to be good Israelite boys. And so he's off in a far country. Okay? Remember, we've talked in the past, maybe you weren't here, but I'll just say it again, that there are, uh, there's a couple of words that we still use in, 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 in our church, uh, unfortunately. Uh, like the Hebrews talked about other people who were not them. They talked about them as goyim or Gentiles. You were either one of us or you were one of them. We, of course, talk about Adventists and non, non ad. See, see how it just, see why, now you know why I've kind of cut that one out of my vocabulary. Because I don't want to think of myself in those terms because I don't feel God thinks about humanity in those terms. But Jesus is talking to his people and he's saying, this guy went to the other people. And he spent his inheritance in riotous living. I love the King James. Riotous living. I mean, he went to all the raves. He went to all the right restaurants. I mean, let's just face it. He, he, he was living an L.A. lifestyle. Large. And in full color. And it costs you. It costs you to have that Porsche. It, it, it costs you to have the, the right clothes. It costs you to go eat in the right places. But he had an inheritance. And he was spending it without thinking. And so that's why we call him the prodigal. So what's happening at home? Well, dad is still a farmer back home doing what he always has done without thinking. He is lavishing his life on the rest of his family and his community. So if this week, if this week, you did the mundane thing of going to work and, and just doing what you always do and you think it's such a boring life, just remember, you are being exactly like the father in the story. You're holding up your end of the bargain. Now, I know what some of you do. You've, you and I have talked about it. And, 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 and sometimes maybe this week you didn't want to get up and go do that. But you knew that that was your job and that you're, you're getting paid for your job and by going to your job, you're going to be supporting your family and, and your community and you're going to be part of the fabric of, that holds all of our lives together. I just want to commend you for being part of those who are like the prodigal God because you see this morning he sent the sunshine and yesterday he sent the rain and you know, he's got a little bit of coolness going on for us right now. And guess what? He's going to do the same thing tomorrow. 
He's promised us that he will, and he's promised us he will be like that for those who stick with him and for those who go over the hill. So that's why I call him the prodigal God. Because he does that, it seems, without respect to those who deserve it or not. So that's where we get to the Beatitudes. The story goes like this. Jesus is speaking to the people on the mountainside, and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. We've learned that this is, he, he's talking about people who, who realize their need for God. Okay? But now what I want you to do is I want you to connect this with the story of this guy who's gone over the hill that we call the prodigal. But I also want you to be watching for God in this story because he plays a huge, huge role. Blessed are those who realize their need. The Bible says, um, and I'm going to use the, the King James again, he began to be in want. Now this is, this is later on in the story, so don't forget that after he ran out of money, it seemed to co coincide, coincide with a, a moment in the economic picture that was around him that there was a famine in the land. We could just call it an economic downturn. Okay? Some of you, like me, are watching carefully to see whether 2018 will be that moment in which we experience another economic downturn. Good that you're watching. Make sure that you're doing what you feel you need to do in order to spend carefully in 2018, okay? Because the melt-up that we are experiencing in the stock market is not going to last. All the gurus are telling us that. So be careful. All right? That's, that's my only financial advice that I will give you because I don't know why to say that to you except that some of you may be hurt if you're not careful. So we need to be careful. He is not careful. The young man is not careful. And he spends all of his resources. All right? He runs out of the ability to take care of himself. And so he hires himself out. And again, here I want you to know is one of the hyperbole moments in the story, one of the exaggeration moments that Jesus is doing on purpose. Okay, so when you tell the story to your children as a Bible story sometime, don't, don't hold back. Okay, you can tell, because you can. You, I give you full liberty. Jesus gives you full liberty to make this story your own. Because really it is, it's all of our stories. Make this story your own and realize that the exaggeration really isn't that much of an exaggeration. But in this case, it's a good Jewish boy who hires himself out to a pig farmer. Uh-oh. <laughs> Pigs. Jews. Israelites. Don't mix. Okay? So you can see the, the massive use of, of irony. In the, the, that Jesus is, is trying to elicit this, this reaction from his audience to say, oh my goodness, he didn't just do that. <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he, he's, he wants to eat what the pigs eat? No way. In other words, he, they thought he'd sunk low before. But now, <laughs> he is, he's like a pig's herd. He's a pig's herd. Ship herd, pig's herd. That's the right word, okay? Pig's herd. When he doesn't get anything to eat for days and he's told, if you eat anything that's given to the pigs, I'm going to fire you, he sees he's in a jam and he begins to think. And the Bible says, the, the King James says, he began to be in want. He hadn't been in want before because he had money to take care of himself, but now he doesn't have the ability to take care of himself. So he's thinking back 
to his prodigal father. Jesus says to the the assembled crowds, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you when you realize your real situation. Beatitude number two, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you, he's basically saying, when when you realize that what you have done has caused you to be in the situation that you're in. And so we, we hear the mind of the young man through Jesus' story saying, man, I'd love to eat what the pigs eat, but I can't because I'll get fired. I will go to my father because, you know, in my father's house, even the servants have more than they can eat. He starts thinking about what he's going to say to his father. And he starts realizing that what he has done has surely broken his father's heart. And now he realizes that he's not worthy to be called a son. So he concocts this speech that he's going to give. As he's walking home, he's, he's rehearsing this speech. I'm not worthy to be your son. I'm wor- I just want to be your servant. Why? Because he wants three square meals a day. I mean, he's sunk that low. He realizes if he doesn't get help, he is going to die. He cannot do it on his own. Beatitude number three. The meek, the humble. He, he accepts the fact that his status has changed. And he realizes he's not worthy of being called a son anymore, but he, he, he just wants to be a servant and he's happy to be that. He realizes he can no longer keep his life going on his own power and that, that he is going to need to operate in association with, with the support of his father. And he knows that his father will do it because he knows that his father is a prodigal father. He he does it without even thinking. What an incredible realization this is, my friends, to, to realize that we have a father in heaven like this. But you know what? There's so many people There's so many people who have not come to this place yet because they think they can do it themselves. They think they can live themselves. Number four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know what? I see the son enjoying the party. His dad has met him at the road. His father has has been yelling to the servants as he is running, galloping down the road to meet his son, which is so unusual. The whole picture, again, is is just exaggeration from one piece to to the next. And And it's about God. He runs out to meet his son. He yells to the servants, kill the fatted calf, get the party tent up. We're going to party tonight because the son of mine that was dead is now alive. And he's alive because he is connected to me again. And how does he show that connection? Ring on the finger. Shoes on the feet. Robe to cover up, to cover up the tattered rags, uh, the glad rags that were now finished in their ability to cover this young man in decency. So he covers his indecency with his best robe, his own robe. Wow. Wow. And, and, and as as, as we go into the party in our minds, here we have everybody in the community rejoicing with this father who has found his lost boy. 
Remember, this is Luke 15, and you've got three parables that Jesus is telling, and this is the, the coup de grace. This is the, the big clincher. One has been the sheep, the other has been the coin, one has been a shepherd, the other has been a housewife, and now it's a, a wealthy landowner who loses his son, his heir. But now he's come back, and as would befit a man of his station, he throws a huge party to welcome home his son. My friends, what do you think of God? What do you think it's going to be like to be at that party that God is planning to throw for all those who come home or want to come home with him? My friends, I, I want to tell you, it's not to be missed. It is a ticket that you really, really want. And we see this chap enjoying this party. He's inside. He's enjoying the party. We, we don't really hear much, but I can imagine because he was inside that he was enjoying the party. Tony Campolo, uh, a favorite preacher of mine from yesteryear, wrote a book, probably a series of his talks, put together in a book called The Kingdom of God is a Party. Jesus is telling the story, remember? So if you want to hear the gospel from Jesus today, realize that at the end of the return, there is a party. And, and, and let's face it, uh, reality TV doesn't do any better, right? I mean, whenever they want to show you people enjoying themselves, they show them at a party. Even the euphemism that we use today, let's party! means let's be in that mode of humanity that is the most most euphoric, the most wonderful, the most happy. There's music, there's food, there's beverages. He's enjoying it. But what happens next brings us to our, our, our Beatitudes for today. Okay, so he's come home. He's come home. But beatitude number five is blessed are the merciful. Paul Harvey, in yesteryear once again, used to say, and now for the rest of the story. <laughs> Love, here's the, here's the sentence for today. You ready? Love demands we have mercy. So if you're going to be operating on the operating system of love in your life, if you're going to be connected to the God who says that he is love, if you're going to show that forward in your life, it demands, it says part of the operating system is you will have mercy. And the Beatitude says, blessed are those who are merciful because then they will be shown mercy. So now we're talking about actions that have reflexive ability upon you. First of all, connection. Because he was reconnected now with his father, he has a robe, he has a ring, he has shoes. We now are, are looking at what's going to happen going forward. You see, he is now going to need to dispense mercy in the same way as the Father had mercy upon him. If he's going to look like his dad, if he's going to walk like his dad, if he's going to be part of the family, he is going to need to be merciful. Just a quick reminder, mercy, grace, two sides, same coin, right? Let's just remind ourselves again, mercy is what? Not getting what you do deserve. Remember, I always associate mercy with not getting a spanking. I don't know about you, but I considered my father merciful. In fact, I pled for mercy. You, you know, in, instead of six, Dad, three. You know, come on, you bargain, right? Some of you have had parents like that, uh, and, and for those of you who haven't, Please praise God today. Please praise God. However, I love my father, and uh, 
and, and, and I think that he did his best raising us. But when, when, when I, I knew that I deserved a, a spanking and I didn't get one, that's mercy. When you're up in front of the judge and you should get a DUI and you just get probation, that's mercy. So what's grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You know, you know very well, you know very well, you should, you, 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 you know, you should get a hundred dollars for the job that you're doing and 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 uh, he gives you a thousand. Why? I didn't deserve a thousand. The bargain we had was for a hundred, but you gave me a thousand. Okay? Some of you should try this sometime. You have the means to do it and it's an awesome thing if you frequent restaurants where there are very busy waiters and waitresses who probably are hoping for 10 or 12% on their tip. Okay? If you get to know them, maybe you've been there several times and you know a little bit about them, leave them 50 bucks sometime. Just do it. Okay? That's grace. They didn't deserve it, but you gave it with love. Stories have come out from these kinds of situations that just blow your mind. So I, I'm, I'm just offering that as an opportunity to show grace. Uh, okay, giving what you don't deserve. This is what the father does. He doesn't treat the son the way that he does deserve. That's mercy. And that's kind of our concentration today. But I wanted to remind you of the, the two-sided coin of grace and mercy. Because we often... I think we often talk a lot about grace, but we don't talk as much about mercy. The attitude number six, pure in heart. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. Here, Jesus is now going forward and saying, because of his connection with his father, there's not only going to be an outward appearance difference, not only is he wearing his father's robes, wearing his father's shoes, has his father's ring on his finger, and for all intents and purposes in the community is now back in the family by the mercy of his father. But he too is needing to exhibit a change of heart. A change of heart. So the inward transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we say that, I want to say that loud and clear, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have also need of having an inward transformation. This is something we cannot see, but God can. God knows if you're lying. God knows if you're being true. God knows if you are pure question that we often ask ourselves though is can we change can we change ourselves and the answer again this morning i want to give it to you loud and clear no i cannot change myself i try uh when when i am <laughs> uh, you know pointing out to other people that maybe they would like to change i try not to say change like i have changed I don't even try to say, change like people in the church have changed. So you guys are off the hook too. Because fact of the matter is, none of us can even change ourselves. What does the Apostle Paul say? Man, I do what I don't want to do every day. Ugh. Now, I'm trying for this. And I believe that God has forgiven me. And I believe that God has given me his robe of righteousness. Again, the story. But, you know, I end up doing the things I don't want to do. But God knows your heart. And he is in the process of showing you those things which just don't match up with the way that he operates his kingdom. And when he does that, that's your moment to cooperate with your new status. You're back in the family. You, maybe you've always been in the family. And, and you've always accepted God. 
But if you do that on a consistent basis every day, you're going to come up with those moments where you're going to have to say, okay, God, not my will. Who said this? Jesus? Not my will, but thy will be done. I don't need it to be my way. Thank you, Frank Sinatra. Okay? He, he is. That, that is the national anthem of the humanists. That is the national anthem they were singing in the land where the prodigal son went. And it was, it was what got drowned out by the earthquake or the famine that happened in the land and then the pigs. And then he said, you know what? I'm not going to sing that song anymore. I'm going back to my father. So he sings a new song. He has a new national anthem. And that is, Jesus led me all the way. Ten virgins. Ten young ladies unmarried. They get to light the way to the, to the big party. This is another story that Jesus tells, and, 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 and again, he, he connects with, with a party situation. So are you getting the idea that I'm agreeing with Tony Campolo that as you tell the story to your friends, please tell it in the context of a party, because that's what Jesus did. Five of them bring their lamps and no little extra oil jug. Five of them bring their lamps and an extra oil jug. And Jesus says, the bridegroom delayed his coming. Uh, Eric, what are we, 167 years now since formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? So... Several years back, we celebrated 150, and it was real quiet. We didn't say much. And then it went by, but now it just gets longer and longer and longer. Do we, do we think that maybe the Lord is delaying his coming? I, I think so. Because the situation in that group that was waiting for the bridegroom, I think, and, and sorry, I'm, I'm your pastor, and, and, and I'm just going to say it to you, I think that it's the same as it was then in, in, in our church today. And I'm including myself. They all went to sleep. Okay? When you're sleeping, you're dreaming of other things. You are not paying attention to reality. Okay? But there was a cry that went out and everyone woke up and it was, it was go time. It was time to do their duty. And at that moment, it became apparent that the ones that had brought their lamps only did not have enough fuel for their lamps. And so they begged those who did. And those who did... Sadly, I mean, I'm surprised in some respects at Jesus for telling a story like this, but you have, to, you have to put the context in place. There was a time to get oil, and there was a time to do your job. So I want you to hear that blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God they will get into the party. So how we are connected to God now, how we are allowing His Holy Spirit to be poured into our lives, to have control of our lives now, is the building up of that reserve, if you like, so that when your friend and co-worker at work asks you about things as they're going on in the world today and says, what do you think? And your mouth goes dry. I want you to know at that very moment, the Spirit of God is standing right beside you and he's, he's activating those neurons in your brain and he is giving you the right words to speak. 
because you have looked at those words in the Bible, you have prayed those words on your knees, you have been in connection with the Holy Spirit, and he has gassed you up. So that the thing that comes out of your mouth, the action that comes from your hands, is that which is motivated by the Holy Spirit. This is why we teach our children to sing, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You can't let it shine if you don't have a power source. I recharged a particular flashlight for my wife this week because the batteries were almost out. And I tried it, and it wouldn't work. So got to have new batteries, or the flashlight is not going to work. Blessed are the pure in heart because they're the ones who will not be caught out of oil when the go time comes to do your job. So let's get practical for a moment. How, how can I show mercy? Um, which is really this outward show of connectedness with with your heavenly Father, how can I, how can I show acceptance to others? Um, I'm going to go with traffic right away. I mean, we live in LA. Some of you have really amazing commutes, and I, I, I pray for you. I, I'm so glad to live right here in Santa Clarita. But guess what? I was really glad to see the traffic cops out in Santa Clarita this week. Thank God they weren't behind me with their lights on, but uh, they were for several other people who must have been going too fast. Because ah, I live on Soledad Canyon Road, and I call it the Soledad Canyon Raceway. Okay? I try not to join in too much, but you know that's where I'm still needing help from God to, to obey, obey. What do they say? Obey is better than sacrifice. Yes, yes. And tickets usually are the sacrifice you pay for going too fast and, and getting, getting caught. Traffic, what about the person who's cutting you off in traffic? My wife and I reviewed the rule that we were taught when we uh, got our driver's license. You know, you're supposed to leave a car's length in front of you uh, for every 10 miles an hour you're traveling. That means if I'm doing 80 miles an hour on the 5, I need 8 car lengths in front of me. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm going to leave that much. Right. Because there's going to be 8 cars in there right away, right? So... Yeah, but just ask John Hinkle what happens. Just ask him this week when somebody else isn't paying attention to the car lengths in front. Yeah, John, John Sion got smashed from behind and in front. He smashed into somebody in front of him this week on the five. So please, God bless you as you drive. Be careful. Be careful. Be be merciful. Merciful to that person who needs to get off on the 210 as you're coming down from Santa Clarita and you're coming in there over here in the fast lane and they're zooming over into your lane. Just put your brakes on. There's no need to fly the bird. It really is, you know, it doesn't help. Okay, be merciful because you're hoping that the next time you get too close to an exit and you want to butt in and get off real quick like I did this week, that somebody else is going to be merciful to you. Okay. How about words? How about words? Spouses, let me talk to you people who are married, who go, are going to go home today with somebody you love and, and, and that you're attached to legally and, and because you want to be. Okay. Uh, how, how about, how about this week? <laughs> how about this week? We decide that the words that we use are going to be merciful. Jesus says what will happen, right? He tells us, those who are merciful receive mercy. <laughs> so it's a good deal. I'm just, just letting, letting it out there. It's a good deal in our words to be, to be merciful. Um, I can say some things, and I can say them very quietly like this, and my wife will tell me, stop shouting at me. So sometimes words shout even though they're not said loudly. 
God is working with me on that. Praise God. How about uh, number three, the sharing of resources? Um, the father restocked his son. Sight uns he sees him without hearing his whole story, without getting verification that, that putting that ring, which was a signet ring, people, that's what it was. It was a credit card. It was one of those rings that you could smash into the clay and make a deal with. And it, and, and it held up in court. Okay, so that's what he put on his finger. Don't think it was just jewelry. No, no, no. This was a credit card. Okay, so he restocks his son without even hearing his story. I don't know if God's going to ask you to do that this week for somebody. But I just know this. He is the owner of Thousand Hill Ranch. God says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If you feel that you should help, do it. Because God says, I got your back. And there's an endless supply of where that came from. How's that? You will not be in want, ever. Just go ahead and share. Just go ahead and share the resources. Be merciful. This is maybe something that this person doesn't deserve. That would be grace. Be graceful then. Or maybe this person hasn't got what they do deserve. Show them mercy. Show them there's a Father in heaven who is ready to be merciful. Um, how, do we, how do we purify ourselves? I'm going to just suggest some words to you today, uh, some basic words. Uh, I, I, I took a shower this morning. That is a metaphor for how we get clean, right? We wash. So what is it that you can do this week to wash your spiritual connection? A car metaphor, because I like cars. If your terminals on your battery are dirty, you may not be able to start the car. Oftentimes a mechanic will lift the hood and say, oh my goodness, your terminals on your battery are so corroded. And they take them off, they clean them up, and they put them back on and boom, your connection is back. So if you feel this week, you know, my connection to Jesus just hasn't been what it used to be. When I crank it over, it just doesn't start. Please, maybe you need some cleaning, bathing, uh, Maybe you need it inside. Uh, so I, I tell people, uh, do you like to shower? Oh, the kids, when I tell stories like this, they always raise their hand and say, oh, yes, love to shower, love to bath. What about drinking water? Okay. So I just say drinking water is like a bath for your insides. What about our spiritual life? We need the water of life to cleanse us. So I'm challenging you this week, as I'm challenging myself always, uh, think of ways in which you can take in more of the water of life, the ways that you can take in uh, more of the oil of the Holy Spirit. Honesty. Maybe, maybe it's going to take a dose of, of honesty. You look, you look and you say, you know what? I am just not where I should be. I want to be pure. I want to be... I don't want anything in between. Isn't that what the old... Him says nothing between. Maybe there's something between. Maybe there's something you're mad with God about and it's messing up your connection. Because I don't believe, can't because he was human, I don't believe that the prodigal son when he got home, you know, had a, you know, never had another argument with his dad. He probably had an argument with his brother, that's for sure. But he rejoined the family, and he maintained that connection. That was, that was, I think, part of something we can infer from the, the very, very exaggerated story that Jesus tells. So there's, there's going to need to be some investment on our part if we want to be pure. There's going to need to be some time. We're going to maybe some resource uh, reallocation. Uh, there's definitely going to need to be some refocusing. Please, that's a huge word with me these days. 
uh, and I think it's part of Re- Revelation 14, 7, where it says to pay attention, fear God. So if we're the people who are supposed to be telling the world that, maybe we should be doing that too. Maybe we should be paying attention, focusing on God at this time. It's going to take some determination and it's going to take some celebration too. If you get to the end of the week, this coming week, if you get to the end of the week and you got up an extra 15 minutes early and you read your Bible for that time, I think you should celebrate. I think you should say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me the energy to come and meet with you more regularly. I think it was Steve Green who who sang the song, I I miss my time with you. Folks, Jesus is in love with us. He is in love with us. And when we stiff arm him on time, I, I, I don't have to tell you because I think every single one of us knows what that feels like because somebody else has done that to us. Please do not think that God is not hurt by that. I know he is when I don't spend time with him because he loves me and I know he loves you. And so, you know, if we, we're like, later, <laughs> just remember how that felt when that happened to you because you're doing it to God. So I'm saying I'm going to redouble my efforts to keep my focus, to be, to be determined because I would like to have it said, blessed are the pure in heart because folks, This is the best deal out of these entire uh, Beatitudes. You ready for it? For they shall see God. And I don't know about you, but it's, it's pretty amazing having a God who turns the lights on every day and sends us rain to, to keep the fires down or maybe finish them off. You know, um, he is so wonderful, but I haven't seen him face to face. And as I, as I get older, maybe as you get older, you are like me, you are saying, you know what? This business of an invisible God, I'm longing for the time when I can see him face to face. This person who has loved me so much all my life and who has promised to take care of me and promised to bring him back, bring, bring me back together with him. I am, be- I don't know, maybe it's, coming up in you too, that you're longing to see this person. You want to know what they look like. You want to, you want to be in their presence. <laughs> Isn't that what Moses wanted? I want to see your face, God. God says, no, dude, I've got to put you in the crack. Pushes him into the rock, puts his hand over him and passes by, showing only his back. He says, because if you see my face as a sinful human being, you will die. So blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. How do we get pure, folks? How do we receive that pure? It is because Jesus comes into our heart. And because he is pure, we are seen by the heavenly father as pure. That is the gift of righteousness. That is the robe of righteousness that is flung across all of our shoulders when we come home and when we are in his presence. So I I want you to know, if you accept that robe today, which I hope you all do, I know I have, just know that that's how God sees you. He doesn't see you as this person who went over the hill. He sees you as the person who came back. The person who who maybe didn't understand the kind of relationship that he wanted to have with you. You wanted to just have a servant relationship, right? But no, no, no. He's saying, you are my son. You are my daughter. Kill the fatted cow. Because we're going to party. Because this son, this daughter of mine that was dead, that, that was not connected to me, is now connected to me again. And so there's a hallelujah. There's, a, there's an amazing moment that takes place. My friends, it happened for the prodigal son when he came back to the prodigal God. And it can happen for you and for me too. Amen. Amen.